ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಐ ಸಿ ಟಾಕ್ಸ್ ಅ ಪಾಡ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಬೈ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಲೋರ್ ಇಂಟರ್ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ one would think that it's a um, it's kind of a luxury to think about the past when the moment is so loaded but i would make the argument that it's actually very crucial to think about history and to take that in board in the way that we try to understand the world around us first of all epidemics are not are unique in time and place so they're not uniform and we can experience that uh, they're different uh, at the same time in different parts of the world as it is all too obvious today but i would also stress that history one thing that history doesn't do is to have um, to give lessons to be learned you can't import kind of lessons taken away from one epidemic and project them wholesale on another one that was Dora Vaga, lecturer in Medical Humanities, University of Exeter. This episode of BIC Talks is in association with Science Gallery Bengaluru and was originally part of their ongoing exhibition season, Contagion, open until the 13th of June 2021. Do visit bengaluru.sciencegallery.com for more talks and and an exhibition experience of contagion over to jahanavi phalke director of science gallery bengaluru science gallery bengaluru is a part of an international network of galleries university linked a uh, network of galleries which tries to bridge the gap between research and the public at large contagion is our first fully online full exhibition season and as a part of an exhibition season we have public lecture series we have films we have master classes and workshops and events one of the reasons behind having a public lecture series is to bring to bear upon a single topic research that has been carried out in disciplines that are very diverse in nature so for us the sciences means the human and the natural sciences both and therefore in our lecture series we have historians sociologists art artists curators ed- epidemiologists public health specialists clinicians laboratory researchers all of them speaking to the single phenomenon of contagion in this case this lecture series is supported by the indian national science academy if you are interested in the history of pandemics which is what dora will speak to us today about do check out contagion in the 21st century which is a small exhibit about the life and work of robert cock but also do try to attend the, a walk through in the museum of the robert cock institute that we have organized you'll find the details for this event uh, in the chat box later uh, this evening also have a look at controlling the plague in british india which is a photo essay by christos linteris who is going to speak to us tomorrow as well so coming to today's lecture we are delighted and i am absolutely delighted to welcome a colleague dora varga to speak to us about after the end of epidemics dora is a senior lecturer at the department of history and the welcome center for cultures and environments of health at the university of exeter she is also a co-editor of the journal social history of medicine her work spans from the politics of epidemic management to public health systems and access to therapeutics she has written about the global infrastructure of diphtheria and toxins the politics of vaccination during the cold war which she will speak to us today about hospital care of disabled children on, and all under 20th century communism dora over to you thank you very much and thank you so much for the invitation i'm so happy to be part of this wonderful event or i don't even i don't think we have the right word for <laughs> such a wonderful initiative um but i'll uh, start without further ado to start my talk and what i would want to focus on today is the endings and uh, of epidemics and what happens after which is something that i have been thinking about for quite a while and it has become quite relevant these days as we're in the middle of a huge pandemic i think at any point in time we would need to think about how we tell the stories of epidemics and how we see the endings and how we approach them both in terms of policy in terms of personal experience and in terms of history of course first i would like to talk a tiny bit about why i think history matters in this situation 
one would think that it's, um, it's kind of a luxury to think about the past when the moment is so loaded. But I would make the argument that it's actually very crucial to think about history and to take that on board in the way that we try to understand the world around us. First of all, epidemics are not are unique in time and place, so they're not uniform, and we can experience that. Uh, they're different uh, at the same time in different parts of the world, as it is all too obvious today. But I would also stress that history, one thing that history doesn't do is to have, um, to give lessons to be learned. You can't import kind of lessons taken away from one epidemic and project them wholesale on another one. So, but then, you know, what's the point in thinking about it in historical terms? Well, real-time in-depth analysis is usually not possible. There's just simply too much going on, too many aspects happening at the same time. It's quickly changing, and we don't have time simply for that kind of analysis. But historical research permits the detailed understandings and exploring stakes and long-term processes. So we can take basically questions and points of entries of analysis to the current moment and use them to help us to think about what's going on. So what I mean is, for instance, understanding the context. What happened in the past is not isolated in the past. It informs and has shaped structures, inequalities, and frameworks in which epidemic response operates in. That's one of the, one of the key things to understand what the problems are, where they're coming from. We understand what, we need to understand what happened in the past. And the other important point is that uh, with a historical view, we can explore unintended consequences and we can um, pay attention to the temporalities of epidemics. And time is, of course, the bread and butter of historians. And this is something that I would like to talk about, how we see those temporalities, how we see endings, crises, endings, and what happens after. And this has brought me to think a bit more about the epidemic narrative. Narratives are not just, you know, storytelling, but we're constructing meanings of epidemics as they unfold. We're telling the story of what is happening now. This is also for us personally, how we have experienced the, the recent months, the recent years, what we're experiencing now, how that fits into our life story. It also informs of us how we see this as a part of our country's history and where we see this going, where we see this coming from. And the epidemic narrative of how we tell the story of an epidemic is also used by, public, uh, by the public and public health planners looking back and evaluating, reconstructing the narrative. Okay, you know, sitting back, what happened? How did this unfold? What were the problems? Um, what were the consequences? The way that we tell this story is not only about what is true and what is false. And of course, this is a very serious problem nowadays, uh, pointed out by many of the kind of issues around fake news or how certain news are termed as fake while others are not, how stories circulate. But there are also tools of data selection and frameworks to understand disease and health. So what we're thinking, the way that we tell the story also refers to what kind of elements we're using to build that story. What kind of data are we using? We can't tell a story of, a, of an epidemic, even as we're experiencing, by incorporating every single thing. It's just not possible to do that. And this kind of narrative construction becomes increasingly important in the case of new diseases, which are surrounded by scientific uncertainties. So as, you know, if you think back a year ago, now more than a year ago, when uh, the, the epidemic was unfolding and there was a lot of uncertainty, how it spreads, what to do, what are the efficient ways to go about curbing the disease, what will be the consequences of it, and how do we treat it. There were so many, uh, so many uncertainties on so many levels that it became particularly important to understand where did this start, where is it going, how do we place this in a broader context, and that becomes very, very central at some point in time. Now, some of these narratives are quite seductive, and this is something that I've been thinking about. What is the pull? Why do we tell the story of an epidemic in a particular way? And we're all very familiar with this pandemic bell curve, which you can see here, kind of uh, acceleration, the, the crisis point, 
and the the ending. And you can see here, there have been a lot of conversation in the past year about flattening the curve, making that crisis point lower in terms of incidence. This is based much around numbers, incidence rates, uh, or numbers of cases, numbers of deaths that happen during an epidemic. And this has, you know, a beginning, a crisis, an end. And it serves very good purposes. One is to propel response. We're going up on the curve. You know, there needs to be some kind of innovation. We can see that, you know, vaccine development is one of these um, things. When there's an end in sight, you know, to work towards, um, you have policies being brought into practice, coping mechanisms. It's also important for us personally to see that this is not, you know, a case of getting worse and worse and will never end. There will be an end point. There will be a moment when we, just as um, riding on a roller coaster, we get to the top and then we can go down. And that is a kind of preparation that makes it easier sometimes to, to cope with epidemic crises. But this kind of neat curve doesn't always accommodate the multiplicity of the epidemic experience. What do I mean by this? Well, it doesn't necessarily accommodate if we take the whole pandemic as a whole on the different ways and varieties in which epidemics are experienced across the world, what parts of the world are in crisis mode, what parts of the world are currently working towards what less and less used perhaps with the recognition that there is no normalcy or we have to have a different understanding of normalcy what are areas that haven't been touched yet, but even within societies, where does that crisis point lie for whom and who is left out of these um, points, especially the ending. So this kind of telling and uniform telling of the story and this neat beginning crisis and end can render people and processes invisible, people who don't fit into that kind of telling, people who experience multiple crises and that don't map on this um, bell curve, or people who, for whom the epidemic is not over when there is a, an endpoint declared. And I will come back to that um, in, a, in a little bit. So this is why the way that we tell the stories, even as they happen, and also looking back matter, and, and this can concern a lot of people in a lot of different ways. So let's um, come to the question of endings. So endings are, I think we can all agree very easily, are very, very messy and complicated. And they also bring up the question of how we determine that ending. What do we mean by ending? Is it the ending, the lack of cases anymore? Is, is the ending a complete eradication of a disease, like the way smallpox has ended, or in much of the world polio? Are we talking about a virus or, or a pathogen? Is it a crucial point where the incidence rate is low enough for it not to be a major public health concern anymore? Or is it a social phenomenon? So are we talking about the ending when a large portion of society is no longer interested, involved in it, thinking about it, or where did this ending lies? And these different kind of endings don't often map on the same timeline. They don't map on the same timeline globally. Maybe a pandemic ends in one place while still going on in the other, or maybe it's no longer an international concern, but relegated to national policies and, and attention. But the, the main question remains, how do epidemics end, who decides, and who is left out? So these are the questions I would like to, to think about in the remaining of the talk. Before we move on, I would also like to mention here, you know, coming back to, to the narratives and thinking about endings, is the importance of what kind of metaphors we use. So with epidemics and this pandemic, it's often, especially by politicians, framed as some kind of war. It's a war against a virus, there's a common enemy that we're all fighting. It's often portrayed as such. It's also a tool to mobilize people against this disease. But it also is problematic because we think of wars as having a clear end, right? Um, there is a peace treaty, there's a laying down of arms, and we're over and done with it. 
And that is the end of the war. If you think about World War II, you know, there is a victory day. You can think about various different wars where there is, you know, the signing of the peace treaty in the way that we've learned about it in school. However, wars don't end also with a peace treaty, or we can think of the complexities with which wars end. And Maybe in the end of the World War II, millions of people are still in displaced people's camps scattered across the globe. People can't be demobilized from one moment to the next. There might be still rationing system for years or decades along the line. Different parts of a bigger war, different countries sign different treaties at different points in time. You know, even if we think about it as a war, that also has this dual face of seeming like something that ends with a clear cut off and actually on the ground goes on for many, many years. And so that is something that I would like us to think about. But we're going to go now into a different kind of war, the Cold War. And I would like to invite you to think with me about polio in the Cold War and to walk through with me a very interesting story that can highlight the way that epidemics and pandemics end, which is, of course, what uh, we all have high hopes of and what uh, we are also a very problematic aspect of epidemic response is vaccines. Now, vaccines are very fascinating technology and hugely important in the history of medicine and public health. And I would like to encourage you to think about them. And I think that will be quite easy now that we're in this moment to think about a vaccine that goes beyond merely as a substance in a vial. We all know all too well, unfortunately, today that vaccine in a vial in itself will not prevent or stop any epidemics. It has to be distributed. It has to be produced in enough numbers. It has to get to the population. It has to get to an adequate number of people. And that is why it cannot be separable from vaccination. The vaccine in the vial doesn't do anything. It only does, does something once it's administered. And even for one single person, it doesn't do really anything for a society or for a greater community because it will not stop the transmission in itself. There's also an interesting question of vaccines going from trial to field, how we establish the efficacy of a vaccine. And this is, of course, also a pressing matter right now. And I would argue that social and cultural factors play a very important role in this. It matters what kind of vaccine, how it's administered. So if you need a super cold chain to get it from one place to the other, if you need needles and syringes for it, or if it's a drop liquid, that will determine you know, how effectively you can, you can get it to people and how effective it will be in the end. So it's not merely a biological process. And vaccines, of course, are also political objects. They tell us a lot about the relationship of states and citizens. Trust is very key to vaccination. We need to trust that it works. We need to trust that it's safe. We need to trust the people who are giving it to us. We need to trust maybe the, the country or the processes of origin that enable us to make those decisions that it is safe and it will be efficient. And finally, vaccines are not universal technologies. When vaccines travel from one society to another, from one political system to another, from one country to another, from one climate to another, they are different. They are entering very different relationships and sometimes so much so that it's even difficult to think about them as the same thing because they're so entrenched in the vaccination process itself, which is so much um, connected to social, cultural, and political factors that they're not behaving exactly the same way everywhere in the world. So what I would like to talk about is this Cold War story and then to come to why and how it led me to think about endings and what happens after, which I think is very important. And we should be already thinking about it. We should have been thinking about it before even the pandemic started. Vaccines and ending epidemics have very strong connections to and, and rely on healthcare structures. So you have to get the vaccines to people, which requires the structure to be there, the people to be there to administer the vaccine and to organize this. It's a, it's a huge challenge. So it says a lot about different healthcare structures and the way that they end epidemics 
the speed with which they might uh, be able to end epidemics depends on this as well. And of course, national and geopolitical context is hugely important here. Vaccines in polio epidemics in the 1950s that created in the height of the Cold War almost feelings, and, and which were articulated actually, of there not being a Cold War. Similar to the situation now, there was a huge rise in polio epidemics across the world. They were not happening exactly at the same time as what we're seeing now. So it was not a pandemic in this sense, but there were stronger and uh, stronger outbreaks in the 1950s, so within a decade across the world. So it was happening everywhere and it affected everyone in some way. It wasn't so concentrated into one year. But even so, there was a lot of effort to develop vaccines. There was an urgency to this because there was such an escalation in numbers across the world in the people who were affected by it. And of course, polio is a, is a disease that at that time, especially um, affected mainly children. And this is a post-war moment coming out of World War II. So that was um, a particular hard hit to the populations and the societies that were trying to recover from the war. There were several vaccines in the running. They divided between being dead virus vaccines and live virus vaccines. So very different ways of approaching the vaccine of what goes into the vaccine. If it's a killed virus, or if it's an attenuated to so weakened live virus. And Jonas Salk famously developed the killed virus vaccine. That This was the first polio vaccine. It was licensed in the US in 1955. And soon after it was, the, the, the trials proved it to be efficient. It was immediately licensed, I mean, within hours in the US. And very famously, it had no patent. So polio vaccines, neither salmon nor Salk vaccine were patented. And this was very important. Uh, reflecting on the conversations right now along vaccine patents, this was very important because basically anybody could produce a polio vaccine. This, of course, did not mean that anybody was able to produce the polio vaccine or that the vaccine started immediately spreading across the world. For instance, in the case of Hungary, which is in Eastern Europe, and it was part of this socialist world, sometimes called satellite states or the Eastern Bloc, they did not start importing vaccines. So there was no polio vaccine in Hungary until 1957. And they started the import in the middle of an enormous outbreak. So the biggest outbreak that the country had seen so far. So the government mobilized everything to get their hands on vaccine. And there was a huge vaccine shortage. At this time uh, in Hungary, this was just after the 1956 revolution, where um, citizens of Hungary rebelled against the, the communist regime, and this was defeated with the help of Soviet tanks. So we are in a very tricky political situation here, and Hungary started importing the vaccine, and it was fantastic and, and quite spectacular for me to see the newspaper articles that heralded the arrival of this American vaccine that was brought in by a West German pilot on a Swiss plane, and th these people were celebrated, absolutely celebrated, and heroes for delivering the promise of saving children from polio. Hungary tried then to develop its capabilities to produce the vaccine, and it took them from 57 when they started actually actively thinking about vaccination and started vaccination to late 59, early 60s to uh, actually set up labs um, and, and production of the vaccine. So the patent did not immediate, the, the lack of patent did not immediately make it possible, but in a, in a couple of years, even a really war ravaged and quite poor a country like Hungary could also establish a production. But by then another vaccine appeared and this vaccine was the product of collaboration between American and Russian scientists. Mikhail Chumakov, Marina Voroshilova and Anatol Smirodintsev working together with Albert Sabin. Sabin developed his vaccine, but he needed a place to test it, to do mass vaccination testing. And together with Russian scientists, and also feeding into this were, this, uh, were scientists uh, from the Eastern Bloc, so Czechoslovak and Hungarian scientists partly, they finished developing the vaccine. So that the established the mass production of the vaccine and did a trial that involved millions and millions of uh, children across the Soviet Union. And just as these trials were concluded, 
the Hungary introduced the vaccine immediately in 1959. It was one of the first countries to include it into its national mass vaccination program. The reason for this is that Salk vaccine, which was working very well in most of the world, did not work in Hungary. There was another big outbreak in 1959, even though the uh, children were vaccinated. The reason for this and figuring out this failure was very complex. And there was talk about the low quality of syringes and needles, for instance, that were leaking. There was talk about the method of the vaccination. There were two ways of administering the vaccination. One way given under the skin required less vaccine in a dose. So Hungary opted for that to make the vaccine go a longer way. And there was talk about the vaccine itself, if, if it's not as efficient as we thought. Remember, not that much time had passed before. And there was talk if people were not willing to get themselves vaccinated, if there was a resistance in people getting the vaccine. And this created a circle of blame. People, the state, the medical profession, parents blaming each other for this failure. But in this moment came the Sabin vaccine, which was um, uh, successful. It was easily administered. Children got it with tea in a spoon um, in Hungary. And this vaccine that was the result of a collaboration between Soviet and um, American scientists and very much seen as a Soviet product. And with the very quick reaction of the Hungarian government to take this vaccine created a very strong pride and immediately concluded that this is, of course, due to state socialist regime that is in power and ideology that heralded um, for everyone to have equal access to healthcare and for everyone to have access to vaccine for free. Of course, Hungary, as administering the vaccine to its own population, did not make that much of a difference globally. Surrounding countries were worried that um, Hungary using the live virus vaccine, which created the circulation of the attenuated uh, virus, might leak into unprotected populations over the border. Of course, there were also concerns, and we can see this very well in East and West Germany, of one type of political system being ahead of the other. But in itself, it did nothing to prevent polio for the global population. And even just getting the vaccine to Hungary or elsewhere became the object of vaccine diplomacy. So vaccine diplomacy that we hear today, we hear a lot of talk about today, is not a new thing. This was there already in the 1950s. Of course, it's an epidemic situation, new vaccines, there were global shortages. So there was a lot of strategic thinking and maneuvering and diplomatic maneuvering of who gets how many doses and who can get their hands on vaccine. More affluent nations were quicker to be able to produce their own vaccine, again, uh, with the lack of patent, and others were buying and importing the vaccine. But of course, it mattered how much it costs and how much is available. What I found is that, for instance, in the first purchase of vaccine from the US to Hungary, that uh, took quite a bit of uh, diplomatic work. Hungary was not very accepted. This new regime was not very accepted globally. The UN was, was preparing a, a commission to assess you know, what had happened in, in the revolution. But they managed to purchase commercially vaccine from the United States. In the American newspapers, this was presented as aid to Hungary and heralded as the United States giving aid to Hungary and sending vaccines. The way that vaccines traveled across the world also drew on pre-existing networks. And we can see this in the case of the Sabin vaccine. What we can see is Eastern Europe became one of the first areas that was heavily vaccinated with the Sabin vaccine, with vaccine coming from the Soviet Union. Cuba became the first country in the Western Hemisphere to eliminate polio with Soviet vaccine and Czechoslovak uh, virologists um, helping to organize the vaccination. And what I've also found uh, is that there was uh, also a very strong network unfolding of especially Soviet vaccines traveling the world. Um, 100,000 doses arrived to India, for instance, in 1961. 100,000 doses is not 
all that much, especially because you would need several doses to reach full immunity, but it is indicative of the kind of connections that uh, uh, the Soviet Union was trying to make a lot of these vaccine donations, or, well, it's unclear for me right now if these were you know, going the other way, if these were indeed purchased or donated to African and Latin American countries as well. So it was also about establishing global influence. And then the World Health Organization also had a very strong role in this, um, setting standards of production and vaccination. So, you know, what is the minimum requirements that labs and vaccine production sites need to have? What is the mode of vaccination? And all the details, technical details of this were standardized in the WHO. And the WHO also did important validating work. After the Soviet trials, certain countries, especially the United States, um, certain public health officials and virologists were hesitant to accept that actually data presented is actually um, trustworthy. The WHO stepped in to assess the trials and to give a stamp of approval that yes, actually what the Soviet Union is saying is so, we've checked it and you can trust the results. And now we're, we're getting to this point in vaccination where certain countries have eliminated polio, others are introducing it um, one way or the other into their uh, vaccination system. But, you know, wow, what does this mean for the end? And I'd like to um, point out the importance here of declaring an end. And declaring an ending is a retrospective act, right? You don't know that something's ended unless you, you know, already some time has passed. And you can say for certain, okay, that's, that is in the past, that is over. So what is this de declaration? Um, what does it mean for public health and healthcare? Well, we have seen in many countries that there had been premature declarations of ending. We're over it, done, I think we did well, and then suddenly, boom, there is a new wave, um, um, sometimes even a more devastating one. This happened in Hungary after 1957, when the, a lot of the population was vaccinated, the government and, uh, and uh, public health officials were really celebrating the, the feats. There was no outbreak the next year, and it really seemed that this was it, until in 59, there was a huge new wave. The declaration of ending can also shift funds and focus to the disease um, nationally and internationally. So when we declare that something's ending, not in crisis mode anymore, so funds might not be available, um, for it that had been before. The emergency declared is over and funding is shifted to other causes. And uh, finally, the question who is left out of that ending, what kind of local, national and global inequalities we can see in ending. Going back to polio, in Hungary, there were no more outbreaks after 1963. And with this, that kind of blaming and question of why the Salk vaccine didn't work, that got a clear answer at least in the way that it was communicated, Salk vaccine became in Hungarian eyes an imperfect technology. It was just not as good as the other vaccine. So all the complexities of you know, why the vaccine might not have worked or delivered the efficiency that was they hoped for got erased and uh, became a very simple uh, answer. As I mentioned, there was um, a huge, and working towards that ending, there was a huge traveling of vaccines within the socialist world as well. And uh, actually, Czechoslovak scientists had already started raising the issue of possible eradication, global eradication of polio already in the 1960s. So 20 years before actually the polio eradication program was considered and kicked off. And when it was kicked off in the 1980s, this socialist story and the kind of socialist world's role in this, in developing the, the vaccination method and the vaccine itself, and its traveling across the globe was completely erased, it completely disappeared. And so that is also what had been brought by the ending, this retrospective um, reconstruction of the narrative that I was mentioning in the beginning. Another important thing to look at, apart from, you know, declaring an ending is the, you know, often are referred to as survivors. And this is also a problematic term of, you know, who we call survivors and what kind of um, meanings are attached to them. But what it really brings home is, you know, for whom does an epidemic end? Did polio epidemics end for people still living in iron lungs for decades, um, even after, after the, the outbreaks ended? for people, for children who grew up disabled, you know, what ending are we talking about? 
when in the middle of epidemics, we have this coupling of the chronic and the acute. So there's a, there's a huge crisis in the, the, the treatment of acute disease, but in the, at the same time as it's producing people with long-term care, for instance, for assisted breathing or long-term care for the so-called long COVID, um, that is, you know, that is all handled together. The prevention and treatment, you know, there are decisions on prevention and treatment, especially on a policy level, are taken together. You know, how are we going to balance this? What are we focusing on? But, but they're all part of the same. And when the epidemics end, this kind of gets separated. There's the treatment and maybe long-term treatment, and there's um, prevention methods, and they become decoupled. And what it also creates then is situations where the urgency is still there um, for a lot of people. And I've looked at people living in iron lungs. The urgency of care is there, but the emergency, this idea of emergency is no longer is gone with the end of epidemic outbreaks. So it's not in emergency mode. Healthcare uh, systems are not in emergency mode. People are not in emergency mode. But for many people, the urgency of addressing their situation continues. And just on a brief note, the, there's a lot of complexities in how diseases carry forward and meanings of disease carry forward. And here is uh, the case of a um, Ebola nurse who was featured on the front page of Time magazine as one of the people of the year. And a couple of years later, she needed urgent medical care, but people did not want to engage with her. Um, and even medical professionals were hesitant to engage and help her and, and do the necessary uh, interventions because she had had Ebola and because she was working with Ebola patients. And so in that sense, her body was carrying forward still the epidemic itself. And sadly, she died. This led to her death. So this brings us to, you know, the, the key point of how can we think about these endings and, you know, what comes after. And I think it's so important to, to think about this, even as we're in this moment, to consider, you know, what kind of things tend to be forgotten as we move forward, what kind of narratives are rewritten and to, to be conscious of, of that process that we do make. Um, and some, are, uh, some of these processes are intentional, others maybe not, but to be mindful of the way that narratives are, as I said, constructed at the moment, but also retrospectively, you know, who is not remembered, who is um, left out in the case of polio, you know, this kind of socialist story, the, uh, the networks, the, the political context is kind of forgotten as polio eradication and disease control becomes something different, something very different in the late 20th century and today. There's also an interesting and important thing of, of how the disease changes after the end. And what I mean by this, through this poster of Jackie Chan, um, who's showing, and this is from a good couple of years ago, but this is kind of what led me and, and prompted me to think of the whole issue, where he's showing us that we're this close to ending polio. And this is part of the polio eradication program. And some of you might be familiar with, with this particular uh, campaign. But what struck me in, is that when I first see this poster, I was just coming from talking to, to people who had polio and were living with polio. Polio was very much, you know, had not ended in their lives and their number were, were, were many. And so I, it prompted me to think, what ending are we, what is ending um, on this poster? What is Jackie Chan showing us? And of course it is the ending of a virus. And it's a very specific way of understanding a disease. It's the ending of new outbreaks and it's the ending of virus transmission, a very particular biological meaning without the complexities of treatment, without complexities of symptoms, without the complexities of many, many people, hundreds and thousands of people still today who are living with the disease and will continue to live with the disease for the rest of their lives. So that is one thing that is very interesting. What happens, you know, after there are no more outbreaks, what does this disease become? How does this, the meaning of the disease change? And in different kinds of diseases, you can see this going on of something that HIV AIDS, you know, the meaning of HIV AIDS as it changes over time with the removal of crisis point from certain countries and parts of the world 
to a chronic disease or condition. But this, of course, also links to this other point that I've mentioned before, you know, for whom is it after the end? You know, for whom has it ended? And where does it still go on? But it's almost like a bubble or a deviation from the normal because this disease has ended already. What happens is also a loss of expertise and specialization that might come after the end. So what happened in Hungary, for instance, that there were no more outbreaks. So patients lost access to specialized hospitals. They lost access to specialized care. And over time and over the many years, no new people were trained in uh, polio care. So polio patients were the only ones who knew what was going on with their bodies, who knew anything about their disease. And so <clears throat> that kind of place of knowledge also um, changed. And of course, the after the end raises um, the question of, you know, is this end kind of suspended ending? Does it only exist with a continuous commitment to prevention? But then, of course, what if the continuous commitment of treatment is taken away, you know, with this loss of expertise and specialization? And what happens when something, something goes wrong and that prevention regime changes, which can be for, for various reasons? So this is basically what I wanted to um, come to in a roundabout way to think about epidemics also as um, in their temporalities and also as how we tell stories about them and think about, you know, what the stakes are in determining an end, thinking what the stakes are in, uh, in how we think about disease, how we think about the people who are affected and what the consequences of that are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dora. That was wonderful. In this sort of moment for bringing a distance, a critical distance to the story of the epidemic, because what we are in at this moment, and very rightly so, uh, we have a commitment, as you said, a strong commitment to prevention, and that seems to be the end of it. But already, even within the span of a year and a half that we've lived with the pandemic, we know there is something called long COVID, for example, which is what people are going to live with, with lung damage, with heart tissue damage, um, etc. And we are still to find out what the meanings of this are. And this is only something that that's actually visible to us right now. There, there will be other things that we don't know that we will be dealing with that come along. And therefore, what do we call an end? And I, I think it's it's wonderful because only a historian could do this job. And, I, and I'm glad to have, have your perspective on this. There's another point you raised in your lecture, which was about the metaphors in which we think about epidemics. And it's, it's the metaphors of war and it's the meta metaphors of conquest and how do we win over an epidemic, which is seen as an enemy, as a foreign virus, etc. And so it works on those lines. For our viewers, there's a fabulous film by the artist Miriam Ghani, which Dora, you might have actually seen already. Uh, it's called Dis-Ease uh, on our web pages. So please do see the film. Uh, it's very, very intriguing. It's been made by an artist who looks into the language and our approaches. And, and the very thing that Dora talked about at the end of her lecture, which is how do we view and what is at stake in how we view disease? So it's a fabulous note to bring into this sort of soundtrack of the epidemic that we're all kind of living through and you know, uh, it's bothering us. So without taking more time, let me now uh, look into the questions that we have from audiences. The first question is from Shupriya Das who wants to know, taking from the story of the Salk or the Salk vaccine, can history repeat itself? And this will be an opinion question, Dora, for you. Can history repeat itself with the COVID vaccines? Because currently many countries, including India, are constantly trying to circulate more and more vaccines globally, especially to developing countries. So if the vaccines do in fact end up failing in certain countries or in certain locations, do we know from history what the effects might be? That's a very... Good question and reflecting, you know, on the various things that go into evaluating and declaring, you know, if a vaccine is efficient as a, as a preventative method, and also what is a failure, you know, what can we term as a failure. And here I, you know, when I was looking into the complexities of this, you know, trying to understand what happened in Hungary with the salt vaccine, in the, um, before the Sabin vaccine made an appearance, the, the most of the the conversation was around the vaccine itself is efficient, but you know something um, went wrong, or that the vaccine is on the lower end of uh, efficiency, and we cannot know. There's no way to know what the outbreak, the second outbreak, would have been 
if there had been no vaccination. So a lot of uh, doctors argued that actually it was it was a slightly smaller outbreak than the first one, and we didn't have a full blown catastrophe because there was vaccination. So this kind of you know where is the failure? Uh, there and who's responsible for it, I think, is an important thing. And of course, again, a retrospective act. But of course, there are a lot of ways in which vaccination can go wrong. And that happened in um, uh, with vaccination as well. With the Salk vaccine, for instance, in the United States, um, there was this um, very famous incident called the Cutter incident, where there was a faulty batch of vaccines and children got polio from the vaccine. And so, you know, what that did to undermining the, the trust in vaccines was, of course, huge, but it was understood very differently for very different people. So within the U.S. context, it was understood that there needs to be more federal regulation to make sure that everybody's, you know, that the production is safe and that companies you know, are liable for this and people are aware of risks. So there has to be more oversight. In Hungary, it was represented as, you know, well, there you go. You can see that capitalist uh, United States is only, only um, concerned with profit and they're willing to give, you know, like to throw their children into uh, sacrifices for this goal. So, you know, what, where that, you know, how that is explained is very, it, it depends very much on the context. So, you know, coming back to your question, it depends, you know, on, on those political connections, on those cultural connections. It depends on, you know, how it plays out, how, how then it is retrospectively seen in light of other vaccines, in light of other relations, and so on and so forth. So it's very complex, and I don't think we can kind of divorce it from these all these other issues. Uh, Amartya Sinha would like to know, how important is it to quantify the end of pandemics, whether it is enough to declare the end of disease scientifically, or if the public managing the public perception of it is seen to be more important. So what, what is your learning? What I would like to see, <laughs> let me put it this way, is just more attention to the multiplicity of these endings. Yeah. There is definitely, I mean, you know, incidence rates are are you know real and and they're they're changing and disappearing or rising. And that is a very important marker. And I think that is what leads policy overwhelmingly. So the quantifiable bit, but what is quantified is also a question, right? The, the quantification of incidence rate, not, for instance, the people living with long COVID or the effect on, on society, which can be quantified in all kinds of ways. I would argue that there should be a more multifaceted way of determining ends and there should be attention to that endings happen for in different aspects and at different times for different people because if we only concentrate on this biological and or scientific in this sense on the virus itself and nothing else then you know we lose all the people living with long covid we lose the support for them and for them you know and and for for societies the epidemic might be, you know, going on for a longer time. So it's, it's, it's not only taking into account the aftermath, but rather taking apart where this ending is and, and being very clear that there are very clear consequences if we declare something to be, to have ended. So I'll ask you a historical question um, because that's what we are historically good at answering. Looking at the context of the Cold War, which is what you've looked at for the polio vaccine and looking at say today, what would be the key specificities that sort of signal how, you know, the trajectory of the vaccine during the Cold War and, and what would you identify as similarly sort of key things that determine the trajectories today? I know the second question is not, not as they say, part of scope, but just, you know, a speculation because I mean, this is, so, you know, we think, of course, uh, in our times, so to speak, but we are able to identify specificities of the past in a way in which we cannot today. But is there something that we can bring from our understanding of politics in the past to um, to today? I would, I would point out the international aspect of this mm -hmm. and, the, and the global aspect. And, and the two things, one is that it was very clear to me the very important role that organizations like the WHO can play the real value, like very concrete value in the existence and the work that, that international organizations do. And of course, you know, the, what comes to light is also how it's extremely you know, complex and 
problematic in many ways. You know, just to mention that that in part of the the story, um, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union were not part of the WHO because they left uh, for for reasons of their own, which were partly you know partly geopolitical, but I would argue that partly justified because they had a very different idea of what international organizations should do that it should be you know it should be supporting with materials and it should be more hands-on as opposed to the the kind of um, technical assistance that uh, that the united states mm-hmm. was pushing so, and 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 a lot of uh, you know other interesting things going on but overall there was uh, an important pro- uh, role that the who played in creating this kind of anchoring the and reducing the uncertainties among the different vaccines and the vaccination methods with teams of uh, and, and committees that were made up of you know um, people and virologists and experts from from all over the world to consider and to to create that and of course making it possible to to be a kind of neutral player in a, in a very heavily um, uh, contested world the other issue is is this kind of collaboration and and to see what what it highlighted for me is that we tend to see the world, especially in in this kind of in its geopolitical tensions, you know, as 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 very clear cut that you know Soviet Union against the United States, and and you know we can see those those mapping on in their conversations regarding China and 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 the United States and the UK and the EU and and you know all that what it also shows us the story is that it's that there were you know very unexpected things happening um and much more dynamic relationships than we allow it for and there were a lot of also a lot of genuinely you know people who genuinely wanted to help and there were a lot of you know political intentions and game playing as well but not necessarily mapping on to what we expected otherwise. Historical documents are incredibly important for us to understand what's happening now and and therefore why people in a way react the way they do. So reactions are not necessarily things that you can actually pre-script in a way. And I think it's, it's, um, you know, the agility, the dynamism, and also the humility to understand those responses that allow a public health system to deal with an epidemic probably far better than, um, you know, uh, they would if they didn't. Uh, pay attention to it. So Dora's lecture today is a part of a 23 lecture series, as I said at the start, all of which supported by the Indian National Science Academy. Uh, These are recorded lectures, thanks to the agreement of our speakers, and they they will be available on our website as a collective for anybody who wants to uh, utilize them, um, you know, for public, further public engagement, but also to listen to them for themselves, uh, non-commercial use only. Most of all, thank you to Dora for taking the time to be with us this evening. Thank you again and have a good evening. Thank you for hanging in there and listening to the full conversation. If you liked what you heard, do share it with friends and family. You can also leave us a review or rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. The crew behind this podcast is Gaurav Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S. Saranaraj and Rahu Tenkaila. Episode artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu, signing off on behalf of everyone at PIC.